Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Galasso and I am excited to be here with you today to talk about a brand new SAS issued by the Auditing Standards Board, which is SAS 149. Now, SAS 149, which is titled Audit a Group Financial Statement, including the work of component auditors and audits of referred to auditors. So you'll notice right off the bat that we have a new term and a new title. Uh, so group audits is getting a little bit of an update. Now this is part of the larger convergence project with the IAASB. The IAASB already approved their ISA 600 uh, back in December of 2021, and it is scheduled to be effective for period beginning on or after December 15, 2023. So as we look at this, um, this is something that we have been expecting uh, from the uh, AICPA because their goal is convergence with the IAASB. In fact, we had several people sit on the IAASB project related to group audits. And so we're going to have a couple of things to talk about. First off, as I mentioned, we have a bunch of definitions. Some are new, some are revised. So let's start with referred to auditor. This is a new definition. This is something we have not had previously, um, but this is very important. Uh, this really has to do with SAS 146, uh, as well as the new quality management standard and to differentiate who is part of the engagement team and who is not. And so a referred to auditor is an auditor who performs an audit of the financial statements of a component to which the group engagement partner determines to make reference in the auditor's report on the group financial statements. Historically, this has been included in the term component auditor, right? So you had component auditors that you made reference to and those that you did not. Now, as part of SAS 149, we are going to have this new term referred to auditor, which is those auditors that we are making reference to. So again, not a surprise there. But what's important about this definition is that a referred to auditor is not a component auditor and therefore is not part of the engagement team for a group audit. This was very important when they were trying to determine the quality management standards as to who was part of the engagement team. Uh, and so they really wanted to make sure they differentiated as to these you know, different types of people who are assisting us. Therefore, they had to revise the definition of a component auditor. And so again, this is really to reflect the changes in SAS 146, which revised the term engagement team to include the term component auditor. So component auditors are part of the engagement. And so as a result, the new definition of a component auditor is an auditor who performs work, uh, oh sorry, who performs audit work related to a component for purposes of the group audit. And a component auditor is part of the engagement team for a group audit, right? So this is intended to improve audit quality, right? The group engagement partner is taking that responsibility for the direction and supervision of the component auditor. They're responsible for reviewing their work, just like any other member of the engagement team. So this was very needed uh, to help comply with SAS 146. Uh, and so they kind of um, separate out these two different concepts. And so um, I think this will also be a lot easier because oftentimes people tell me, oh, I, you know, I'm making reference to them. It's not a group audit. I was like, no, no, you can make reference to them and still be as part of a group audit, right? So now I think this is a little bit clearer as to when we use the term component auditor, what exactly are we trying to get at? Another definition that's really important in this standard is aggregation risk. Why do we have group audits? Well, that is because we are combining multiple entities. Now it could be through consolidation, right? Taking multiple entities and consolidating them. It could be through combining them, or it could be as simple as aggregating different business units, et cetera, uh, including equity method investments. And so as a result, the definition of aggregation risk is the probability that the aggregate of uncorrected and undetected misstatements exceed materiality for the financial statements as a whole. Uh, and so I think this is very important. The goal of this is to say, hey, I really want to, when I add all of these different things up, um, not have a problem. And so making sure that we are um, disaggregating to the point where we have acceptable uh, evidence. And so this was something that was a whole point of having group audits way back uh, when we first started with this, uh, back in the clarity standards, really, where we had the introduction of group audits. 
And even then, there was a lot of confusion over what was a group audit, right? And it didn't have to be a parent sub. It didn't have to have another auditor, right? You could have an engagement team, right? Uh, and just be a different office or it could be, right? And so it was very confusing when we first rolled this out. Um, I remember rolling out the clarity standards, working in a national office and trying to make sure everyone really understood them. So we know from a number of areas that this has been a um, common deficiency in these audits. and so. I think this will make it a little bit cleaner and better understood for others. Uh, in addition to the terminology changes, though, there are also other changes. And probably the biggest one out there is the change towards what we call a risk-based approach. So extant uh, AUC section 600 really required the group engagement team to perform um, uh, work, uh, audit work on what they called a significant component. So you literally had three levels of components uh, and they said for these, you can just do analytical procedures. But for these, you have to do audit procedures. And it was predetermined by the standard. It really wasn't something that you had a lot of flexibility in. And so what they tried to do here is better align this with the other SASs, in particular, obviously, risk assessment and SAS 145 to clarify this. And so this also clarifies the interaction between this and other AUC sections. And so this risk-based approach says, we're not going to tell you what to do. You're going to use your professional judgment in determining which components you need to perform audit procedures for. Uh, so we're not going to have predetermined uh, levels. We're going to let you go out there and figure out what is the right response for the level of risk. Uh, and so when you're planning and performing a group audit, you're going to um, have that engagement partner really do a risk assessment on the group and figure out, OK, which components do we need to do what for and why? Uh, and so a lot more flexibility. Uh, and again, that's going to better align with the ICEs. Equity method investments are probably one of the more interesting areas. A lot of people really didn't understand uh, the fact that if you had an equity, uh, equity method investment, by definition, you had a group audit. Always blew people's mind when I'm like, yeah, actually, this is not not applicable. You have a group audit because you have an equity method investment. Uh, and so this is going to identify uh, the procedures that the group auditor is required to perform uh, when you have these equity method investments. And so it's going to go through and basically say, OK, you need to read these financial statements. You need to look at the timing. Are the fiscal years the same? Is the periods the same? Uh, is the gap the same? And so they're going to ask you a series of questions. And it's going to hopefully identify matters that cause the group auditor to conclude what additional procedures, if any, need to be performed on this investment uh, in order to do it. So when you think about this non-controlling interest portion that we have here, uh, what do we need to do to make sure that we have sufficient appropriate evidence and even provide some additional audit procedures to help us get there if we need to, because there are these differences here. So there could be consistency differences. There could be other things that cause us to have to do additional procedures. So again, uh, another area where we see a little bit more clarity uh, that was very confusing for equity methods historically, I think they kind of cleaned up that area um, and made it a little bit more understandable for people. And then for those of you who do single audits, I am a huge fan of this change. Um, I really feel like they've given AUC Section 935 just a little bit more love lately. Uh, we've seen this in SAS 148, the standard prior to this one, uh, really trying to make sure that when we have these standards, right, a group auditor has group financial statements. And it's very hard to apply AUC Section 600 to a uh, single audit. And so prior to this, there were paragraphs of 600 that were excluded. Uh, it was in the appendix in AUC section 935 that kind of excluded, and you don't have to do these things. But even when those paragraphs were excluded, it was very complicated. How do you apply 600 to a group audit? And so what they do here, which I love, is instead they add two additional paragraphs to AUC section 935 um, and the use of other auditors. And then they basically say AUC six, uh, section 600 is not equal in its entirety to single audit. So in my opinion, a very huge win. I think this is a better way of looking at this. Um, they better uh, help us understand. Now they do say if you have component auditors, 600 may be relevant to look at, but it doesn't mandate the use of it um, as we go through here because a lot of the con uh, the concepts don't really apply. So um, very often this is a minority um, auditor potentially that's being involved in this um, as part of maybe the RFP. The, um, the government may be required that they incorporate the use of a, a minority uh, auditor or female owned auditor as part of this and so to incorporate those audit firms in there. And the application of 600 got really sticky. Uh, and so I think this is a much better uh, way of looking at it. I think they did a great job here. 
So when will this be effective? It is for audits of group financial statements for periods ending on or after December 15, 2026. So we have a little bit of runway here, um, but I do think that it is a standard that we will see some early adoption for. Uh, and while they were at it, because again, uh, lots going on uh, in this standard, they needed to make conforming amendments to SQMS number three. Um, so or actually they created SQMS number three to make conforming amendments to the QM sections 10 and 20, uh, because when they did this, obviously the new language that needs to be incorporated. Uh, and they also added some uh, differentiation between what is a resource and what is an information source. And so I think this will be um, a little bit easier to apply. So so um, SQMS number three, brand new as part of this updating the firm uh, system of quality management and engagement quality reviews to use this new language about component auditors and really uh, differentiating between component auditors and referred to auditors uh, and better uh, aligning that. So again, uh, SQMS number three, however, will be effective with the, uh, the QM sections 10 and 20. So again, we have some time before those are effective as well. All right, so that is a wrap on our brand new SES. Hopefully this helps you better understand some of the changes that are coming to our audit engagements. Thank you guys so much for joining me and I hope to see you on a future nano learning. Have a great day guys, bye-bye.